<laughs> in fact, when I had an opportunity to speak with Caucasian, I explained to him that I went to prep school. And I asked, you've heard of uh, Andover? Now, okay, now that's a school where uh, George W. Bush went to school and a whole lot of rich folks, and it's the number one, uh, it is the number one private academy, if you will, prep school in America. And they said, oh, I said, no, I didn't go to school there. I went to the Booker T. Washington Leadership Institute, 715 South Lauderdale. And I mentioned that at one of our meetings, it got a bigger land than I intended. It's not that funny now. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's closer to Handover than, than you, you, they act like I made a big joke. It's not that funny. <laughs> but anyway, what we must do, effective leadership, effective fathership. We have to understand the leadership challenge. We have to elect, if you will, people who are committed to serve us. You see, the concept of servant leadership has lost its way in America. The paradigm for us in the past, throughout our years, has been first we serve, then we lead. First we serve to prove ourselves worthy for leadership, then we lead. Now we got folks who want to lead and don't want to serve. We got folks we got folks, I got my MBA degree, get out the way, I want to lead. I'm ready to be, the, somebody retire, get some of these old folks to retire, get out the way, I'm ready to do. What have you served anybody? You follow what I'm saying? That's the, that is the formula for effective leadership in our community. Now, I'm not saying anything about anybody else. I'm not talking about what anybody has done to us. I'm talking about things in our behavior that we can do to improve our circumstances on this planet, in this country, at this time. Is that all right? You see, Nobody can stop us from doing drugs but us. Hello, somebody? Yeah. Nobody can stop us. Now, I'm going to say something that's a little bit touchy right now. In the 1950s, I was born in 49. 70% of African Americans were born to two parent households. Today, 69% of us are born to single parents. And it's not a formula for success, folks. I happen to believe that God doesn't make mistakes. God created Adam, then he created Eve, then they had children. Ain't that the way it went? Yeah. Now, and I'm not putting anybody down because any child is born is pure. But, and I'm thinking about this, in the 1950s, there was no birth control pill. There were passing out condoms. There was no abortion on demand. There was no morning after pill. There were no patches. They had one thing. They had, they had two things. They had parents telling their daughters, keep your skirt tail down. And they had the aspirin. It's the only birth control we had. <laughs> only the aspirin. Oh, oh I better explain that. <laughs> because I don't want anybody to sit and tell me to take his aspirin. <laughs> there was a prescription that went with the aspirin. They tell the daughter, take this aspirin, put it between your knees, and never let it drop. <laughs> and that's how we avoided, that's how we avoided unwanted pregnancy in the 1950s. Y'all follow? It was effective. <laughs> and so you bought the cheap aspirin for this. <laughs> you did not say joke, you're all baby aspirin. Right? And that's how we accomplished that. Corny, there's a, uh, there's a friend who spoke in, in 2000, Three, let me see this. I'm oh, sorry, 2004 at our annual awards program. A gentleman who's a fraternity brother man out of Cincinnati, Ohio, his name is Mel Gravely. And Mel Gravely said this He said, I believe black people are willing to do business with one another. And he said, and I'm quoting. But the reality is, the reality about supporting our own is not that we won't, not that we won't, it's that there are just not enough of our own that offer you the quality value and service you deserve for your dollar. We've got to correct that, folks. Let me say something to you. Anybody ever heard of Willie Mays? Baseball player? He's the best baseball player I've ever seen. Anybody ever heard of Jim Brown, football player? The best football player there's ever been. Jerry Rice gets some consideration to say. Jim Brown's the best. Anybody ever heard of Michael Jordan? He's the second best basketball player there's ever been. Bill Russell is first. I think I'm lying. Uh, how many fingers you got? How many rings Michael Jordan got? Six. How many rings Bill Russell got? Eleven. <laughs> Ten fingers, eleven rings. Hard to beat. Well, I like Michael Jordan too, so we just said Bill Russell's the best team 
sport athlete in the history of the world. I know what, 11 rings in, in 13 years, that's, it won't happen again. <laughs> he played against everybody and stepped up to the plate. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Play, play the folks they played and put that move in? <laughs> I believe I can fly that move, wasn't that move? But they had a cartoon care, what a cartoon care to play basketball back then. I don't make no more comments about it, I'm gonna be talking to you, brother. I'm just teasing. We're just having fun, it's a conversation among friends. Uh, I guess that now, I about that argument when he said Rocky Marciano wasn't the best boxer of all time. You know, Muhammad Ali was. Hello? Who is this man? <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> I'm teasing you, brother. I love you. Now, good sports arguments and sports conversations go that way. But my point is this none of those folks invented the game that they were superior, where they were superior. We didn't invent capitalism, but I know that with the humanity of the African American, we can do this game better than anybody else if we only be ourselves. You know what our challenge is? And my best friend brought this to my attention about three weeks ago. His name is O.C. Lewis, Jr. He worked, he's the director of the uh, Ed Rice Community Center. We were at my house on a Saturday, and we were talking, and he said, no, we gotta understand something historically. America is, was, a penal colony. Do you understand what I'm saying? The people in England sent their, emptied their jails and sent them folks across from America over here. Just like the Cubans did several years ago. Fidel Castro over to the jail, said, see, y'all go to America. That's what Miami is. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's what happened. Well, that's what they did years ago. And he said, our challenge, hear this, our challenge for us now, and follow this, when, we, when people were sold into slavery in Africa, they were sold into slavery like Joseph, son of Jacob, was sold into slavery. It wasn't to be a lifetime thing. If you remember the story, y'all know the story in the Bible, Joseph became, if you were the prime minister of Egypt. He interpreted dreams and he became a very, very high, what, what amounts to the prime minister? You follow me? Well, Slavery was temporary. They did not know what they were sending the brothers. They didn't know they were not sending them to the lifetime of bondage. So when people tell you, yeah, well, Africa sold us into slavery in the first place. Well, that may be so, but they didn't know that they were selling us into this stuff. You follow me? For the tricks that they received. Also, so anyway, but Osi told me this. Our challenge is to be the people we were, to go back to being the people we were when we first arrived here. You see, Follow this, in our DNA, hello, in our DNA, are the kings and queens of the first civilizations in the world. You follow what I'm saying? And I happen to believe that God does not take his weakest people and give them the greatest challenge. See those of us who are remaining here in America? We are the 25% who survived the Middle Passage. Three out of four, I understand. Some jumped off the boat and, and, and to their death out of those challenges. With chains on, jumping to the water. You know, you can't tread water very well with your hands, uh, with your hands handcuffed. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So some jumped to their death into the shark, into the shark infested waters. Twenty five, and another great many died because they're staying on the, in, the, in, the, in the in the bowels of ships uh, with disease and that such thing. So the twenty five percent that made it were the strongest. We are the descendants of those folk, those of us who remain. So we are strong people. And I don't believe God was in his weakest people to address his strongest challenge. Amen. Am I right about it? Amen. Now, I don't have the mind of God, but it doesn't, God didn't send uh, a, a weak Moses to confront Pharaoh. Did he equip him what he needed, the staff and everything else? Did he not? Amen. It's all right. Somebody say amen or chew that or something. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is this. Success runs in our race. And I was, the work I do now, I'm a salesman, honestly, that's what I do when I sell, I remember businesses, products and services better than anybody got on this there. I was trained in South Central Good and AT&T and with Yellow Pages and that's where I made my bones, so to speak, in sales. That's what I do best. If I were to uh, put together a tombstone for myself and say, here under lies a salesman <laughs> and a loyal friend. If, if he was your friend, a loyal friend, that's what I'd probably say on my, on my, uh, on my tombstone. But my point is this, we did not invent capitalism. I was summoned to this work, I wasn't called. Pastor Holloway was called to his work. I was summoned to this work. Back in 1974, I encountered a poem 
a friend who went to high school with me, who's now the director of student services at a college called uh, DePaul, D-E-P-A-U, in Greencastle, Indiana, was working at Grinnell College in Iowa at the time. He came home uh, that year and introduced me to some work, uh, of some music, a fellow named Gil Scott Heron. Anybody familiar with him? He's a, he's a poet. And he had a poem, the name of the poem was Brother. I was working at the bank then. And I'm at the bank seeing guy leave. They won't let nobody who look like me any money for business. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Mr. Johnson in Chicago, Johnson Publications, went to borrow some money for his business. They wouldn't lend it to him. And he said, okay, lend me some money to take a vacation. He said, okay, we'll lend you some money for that. <laughs> and he started Johnson Publications. Great big old building in Chicago. Y'all seen it? And you go in that building, you know what? You know who the people work there look like? They look like Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Just like the people that, that uh, just like the people at International Paper look like them folk, we have to employ our people. That's why we must support our businesses. Am I making sense to anybody here tonight? Yeah. All right, then. So we have things to do. We have much work to do, and we're equal to this task. We can do it. I know we can. We can do it. I know we can. All right. And if we do it, we will be much the better for it. We will be far much the better for it. As I go to my seat, I am going to read just a little something. Let me make one more point about you in business. Let me share just this one additional thing. Now, I want you to follow what I'm about to say. Each year, the Urban League publishes a publication called The State of Black America. And in that publication, they have what they call the Equality Index. Now, you may remember from your history books that they said that African Americans at the end of slavery we're three-fifths of a man. Of a man. You ever call that? Mm -hmm. Read that? All right. That means we are 60% of what other folks were. Well, in the state of black America, they published the Urban League each year what they call an equality index. And today the equality index is 73%, meaning that we have about 73% of what other folks have, primarily, across the board. Now, the index shows that 73% of the status of white folks, the whites, our economic status Wealth and income is 58%. Uh, social justice index, that's sentencing, enforcement, imprisonment, victimization, uh, went from 73% down to 68%. The health index is 73%. The education index is 77%. And watch this one. The index of civic engagement, that's volunteering and supporting our own, that's such thing is 1.08%. And we gotta change that. But I'm wise enough to know that does not include everything because they don't evaluate what we do in our churches. Most of our civic engagement is done in our churches. The church is the cornerstone of our community. The church is our social club where we go to get spiritual feeding, where we do much of our volunteering and much of our work is in our church. Our church has been institutions that done some everything for us. Our church is an institution where we met to conceive plans to get out of this slavery, to get out of all of this nonsense that we experienced. And our churches were even bombed in the 50s and 60s. They did some fires, they did some burning only a couple of years ago. Might be doing it tomorrow. So the civic engagement index, while it's only 1.08%, does not include our churches, what they did. Their evaluation does not include our churches. They just look at what we do in volunteerism on boards of directors and at the Red Cross and uh, the American Cancer Society and that such thing. But it says to me this, it says this to me, middle class black folk, we have civic rent to pay. We gotta do a greater share of the civic tithing. And, uh, well, we must. One additional thing, you are in business for yourselves. I salute you for that. Do you realize that in terms of self-made millionaires, Self-made millionaires. 1% of self-made millionaires became millionaires by investing in stock, inventions, athleticism, and entertainment. Of all the many self-made millionaires, that 1%, including sports, entertainment, and the stock market and investing, only 1% of the self-made millionaires in that category. 5% of self-made millionaires are salespeople. I should have got out of that racket. <laughs>